Our Father, we say that you are wonderful to us and we want to offer you our lives afresh this morning. We are here to worship. We're here to worship with our mouths, with our songs, with our hearts, and we're here to worship with our lives. We thank you that we're learning this week from a man who worshipped you, not just with his prayers, with the window open, getting into trouble for it. We're here to learn from a character who worshipped you with all of his life, day by day. We pray that our sacrifice of praise and worship to you would be from all of us to you. We offer you that dedication and devotion in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to, for our prayer, focus this morning as the funeral of Pope John Paul II takes place virtually as we speak. I'm going to ask you to join me uh, for a few moments in praying for uh, that whole situation uh, and uh, for the Roman Catholic Church. But first of all, I'd like to share with you a letter that has been sent which we initiated during Spring Harvest last week, which has been sent from the Spring Harvest leadership team and signed by thousands of Spring Harvest guests from both Minehead and Skegness during uh, the previous Spring Harvest break. Um, expressing, uh, well, I'll read it to you and allow it to express it for itself. This is to His Eminence Cardinal Cormac Murphy O'Connor, the Archbishop of Westminster. Dear Cardinal, this letter comes to you signed by Christians of many denominations gathered together at the Spring Harvest Celebration at Minehead in Somerset and at Skegness in Lincolnshire. We were saddened by news of the death of Pope John Paul II. We are writing to express our gratitude to God for his life and witness, as well as to pay tribute to the huge impact he has made not only on the Catholic Church, but the whole world over the last 26 years of Christ-like service. We have prayed for you personally, as well as for the entire Catholic community here in the UK and around the world, that you will know God's comfort and strength as you mourn the loss of such a dynamic global leader. Be assured of our ongoing prayers that God will also grant you his wisdom as together you begin the process of choosing a successor. Let's join together, shall we, in reinforcing what that letter says and those prayers. Our Heavenly Father, we first want to thank you for the life of a leader who had an impact on a global scale whose actions and whose words were listened to and heeded by many millions of people and who affected global events. We want to pray for Cardinal Cormac Murphy O'Connor and we want to pray for our brothers and sisters in the Catholic community both here in the UK and throughout the world that you would encourage and strengthen them at this time. We, we ask, Lord Jesus, that by your Holy Spirit, those who are now gathering together and who have the task of picking the future leader of the Roman Catholic Church worldwide will have great wisdom and understanding as to who that person, person should be. And they would make a good and wise decision. And as the eyes of the world focus today on Rome and on a funeral, we pray, Lord God, that people across this globe would be challenged by your Holy Spirit to consider issues of life and death, to consider life beyond death, to consider the deep issues which they avoid so many people day by day and that the events of today would stir people's thinking 
and stir in their hearts a longing and a searching for the kingdom of God and that unknown, untouchable thing for so many of them which these events represent. Finally, Lord Jesus, we pray that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done in this situation, in every facet of it, and throughout your world. Thank you that this is your world, that you are the ancient of days from the beginning to the end. May there be a recognition of that today in a fresh way. In Jesus' name, amen. This evening, in all the celebrations, we will be taking an offering for the Spring Harvest Charitable Trust. As yesterday, so today, we're going to find out about a project which benefited from some of that offering money last year. Last year, the generous giving of Spring Harvest guests enabled gifts to be given to more than 200 projects in the UK and overseas. We want to tell you about some of the projects that received money from the offering. Projects like Soul in the City. The project relied on local heroes, such as Armand, Tanya and Heidi, who helped coordinate this major event, which brought together 20,000 Christians for a fortnight of evangelistic and community events on the streets of London. Soul in the City was wonderful because so many people came across different denominations and different cultures together um, in, in London to impact the city, impact their communities. At my local church, we help coordinate the projects that were happening in Northfield, Hanwell and Central Ealing. With the local churches and the youth delegates, we came, we cleaned, we scrubbed, we painted, we laughed, we sang, and generally over the two weeks, we tried to invest into the lives of people within Ealing. I was basically here in Althorn Park where we uh, held Kids Day's events, just inviting kids from around this area to come and get and joined in with what we were doing. I partnered up with Tanya to do some local events during the two weeks with a, a gospel choir and just hosting some concerts here for West London wide. The two weeks that we were on the project, we were able to invite them to come and just hear the gospel in a relevant manner, which is through music, hip hop and dance. I think it's left a long-lasting impression that the church isn't just a place behind walls, but it is prepared to come out and be real and be relevant. Just seeing them enjoying themselves, seeing them getting involved with people who they've not met before um, was a great joy for me. It's been an awesome experience just being able to engage with the local community and just understanding the needs and being able to just uh, be Christ in the community. But heroes come from strangest places chances are you won't see their faces Soul and City continues um, it continues into 2005 and beyond because the churches in London are saying and the young people are saying we want this to continue we want to impact our communities more and we're going to see the church arise to touch um, people with the love of Jesus we really want to thank you Spring Harvest for the money that you have given to make Song City happen. Money from the Spring Harvest offering this year will go to fund projects like these. Projects where your giving can change lives. Places where local heroes are trying to sing the Lord's song in their own strange land. Be a hero in the dark. Please turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, which Janet and I are going to read an extract from, beginning at verse 8, which is where the trouble starts. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 8. But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews 
they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they heard the sound of the musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They have defied your majesty by refusing to serve your gods or to worship the gold statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance. If you bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments, all will be well. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. What God will be able to rescue you from my power then? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, your majesty can be sure that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully clothed. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames leaped out and killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell down into the roaring flames. But suddenly, as he was watching, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, Didn't we throw three men into the furnace? Yes, they said. We did indeed, your majesty. Look! Nebuchadnezzar shouted. I see four men unbound walking around in the fire. They aren't even hurt by the flames. And the fourth looks like a divine being. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the princes, prefects, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be crushed into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like that. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. Let's pray. We commit to you now, Lord, this Bible reading. We ask that you would anoint and help Stephen as he opens up these words to us. And we pray for ourselves as well, Lord, that we would have understanding and that your word would teach us something new and fresh today. For speaker and hearer alike, we ask for the work of your Holy Spirit to help us. Amen. Let's welcome Steve now.
Well, good morning. You certainly can't say that the weather's not apocalyptic, can you, here at, uh, at uh, Skegness? Well, I hope you're enjoying this um, week of uh, Bible teaching in Daniel and Acts, and you're enjoying these Bible studies each morning in the book of Daniel. I'm particularly grateful for the way the Bible reading was read this morning. Stephen playing the part of the narrator, my wife playing the part of the psychotic dictator. Uh, <laughs> so easy to get into typecasting on these occasions. Now, you must pray for me. You must pray for me because, um, because I'm hoping for profiteroles for lunch. So, uh, and you may think after that remark, I'm not likely to get lunch of any kind. So, uh, so you must specially pray that I will be given help. Now, Daniel chapter 1, the great introduction. We uh, are introduced to these uh, four fellows in exile, Daniel and his three friends. Uh, chapter 2, yesterday... And uh, chapter 7, we're introduced to this uh, amazing story of uh, Daniel's interaction with the king and, uh, and then, of course, with this incredible vision of the fourfold empires which are to follow, uh, the Persian following the Babylonian, uh, the Greek and Roman, possibly. Uh, and we looked at the way apocalyptic literature unfolds and the great truth that God's kingdom the rock not hewn with hands will last forever, even though human kingdoms are transient and passing. Now, here we are in chapter 3, and we're going to look at chapter 3 and chapter 6 today. Two stories of deliverance. And the great danger with these stories, unlike yesterday, in which you looked at the material and thought, oh my goodness, what is all that about? You look at the two stories this morning, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace and Daniel in a lion's den, and you say, oh yes, I know this. I've known about this since Sunday school days. I've sung songs about daring to be a Daniel. I know all about this stuff. So yesterday, the problem was incomprehension and hermeneutical complexity. Do you remember that? Do you remember that from yesterday? I, by the way, I do suggest you learn these phrases because when you go back home to your churches, it'd be really good to drop into it, you know, in the, in the first place. People are gathering for church, you know, a week on Sunday and you're there. And they say, how did you get on at Spring Harvest? And you say, oh, it was good. And open your Bible, look holy, and say, well, it was hermeneutically complex. And they'll, you'll really rise in their estimation. <laughs> you'll be promoted to the tea committee immediately. <laughs> so yesterday is hermeneutically complex, but today the problem is not complexity. The problem is familiarity and simplicity. Everybody knows the story. So what is there to preach about? You know, I can deal with the whole thing in 30 seconds. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into a fiery furnace. God saves them. Daniel's thrown into a lion's den, and God saves him. Amen. <laughs> Don't think you get away so lightly and so easily. In fact, the very simplicity of these stories uh, hides some fascinating, profound truths about the question of suffering for one's faith persecuted for being a believer in the one true God. Let me, as uh, I usually do, try and talk you through these chapters uh, fairly rapidly. So you'll need your Bible open at chapter 3 and then again in chapter 6 and, and try and dig away a bit at some of the meat so that you are delivered from simply thinking of this as a Sunday school story and you realise it's a story for adults. And anyway... Why on earth these two stories are considered suitable for children, I have no idea. When was the last time you sat up late at night reading your young child a bedtime story, saying, now let me tell you a little story about people 
being burned alive. And another story about someone who's about to be ripped limb from limb by a hungry lion. Now, I hope you sleep well. <laughs> what, by what madness are these two stories, Sunday school stories, anyway? They are definitely stories for an adult stomach, an 18 certificate in terms of violence. Daniel 3 verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, or if you, you're more into the metric sort of measurements, about 27 meters high and almost 3 meters in width. A huge statue, not quite as big as the ancient Colossus of Rhodes, which uh, well, it was another ancient sort of monument that was very significant, but an enormous gold statue. Actually, it's almost impossible that there was enough gold in the Babylonian Empire to build a thing that big. It probably means gold-plated rather than simply solid gold shot through and probably built up. Uh, and it may well have been not a, a sort of a box-shaped 90 feet by 9 feet, but hinting at what Daniel had said in chapter 2 about the golden head, which was Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe he'd seen that uh, uh, interpretative vision as an opportunity to draw his kingdom together. And so he built a statue, perhaps of himself, of gold plate in this place called Dura in the province of Babylon. It looks like, it, it, the word Dura means a walled area, a partitioned area, and it looks like it's situated in a valley about six miles south of Babylon in an area where there's a kind of natural amphitheatre in which at one end a huge statue of Nebuchadnezzar could be erected and he could use it for political purposes. Now you must understand that primarily this statue is not a religious thing, nor is its purpose religious, primarily. Its purpose is political. Now we find that hard to understand, we live in a rather secular society. But the reality is that Nebuchadnezzar is trying to weld this disparate empire together. He's trying to make it possible for the empire to gel. And it doesn't gel and won't gel without some kind of cohesion. And what makes it cohere is the, the possibility... Thank you. We, is the possibility of something which acts as a symbol of unity. And so he gets all these representatives of his kingdom to this walled area, to this plain, and gets them to bow down to it, not because he cares tuppence about the religious allegiance of these various nations. He doesn't. They're all allowed to go on worshipping their own gods. He's not saying, stop worshipping your god and start worshipping my god. He's simply saying, for this point, a sign of allegiance to me will you be you bowing down to the idol. Probably an effigy of himself. And then he's summoned, and then there are two lots of lists in this chapter. Do you see it in front of you? It's got a kind of rhyme to it. I really, if I was clever enough, would deliver this chapter to you in rap. He summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and so on. It's deliberately rhythmic. Dignitaries and officials from around the ancient world. They all gathered together on this plain, and the herald shouted loudly, verse 4, this is what you're supposed to do, bow down. And then you get into this other rap section. And as soon as you hear the sound of the horn and the flute and the zither and the lyre and the harp and the bagpipes, for you Scots... Uh, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever doesn't fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. So what you've got here is the writer having a bit of fun with us. There's deliberate literary humour here. There's this dirty great statue of Nebuchadnezzar and the writer is setting us up for a confrontation that has its humorous moments. It's interesting... Isaiah has a very similar passage about the humour of the fact you make your idols from wood 
and you worship them, but the rest that's left over, you put on the fire and burn. What's wrong with you? Can't you see how stupid that all is? And there's a kind of a Jewish humour here at which you're all supposed to be sort of chortling merrily about this. Ho, 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 all this list of people and all these musical instruments. There's a distinct absence of chortling. Stewards, can we, can we do something about this? It'd be enormously helpful if, uh, for people's concentration values if, uh, if you could find out what that is and, and do something about it. But do it, do it, not, do it in a gentle, Daniel way. <laughs> not in a Nebuchadnezzar way. That would be uh, enormously, enormously helpful. And so you're supposed to get the impression that this is humorous, that this is, that this is funny, uh, uh, and that what's happening is, um, is setting us up for this confrontation. It's as if God laughs in derision at, uh, at such things. Now, why aren't you laughing? Well, because one of the main characteristics of Jewish humor is that it isn't funny. Actually, I, I, I must be careful. I, I'm the chairman of an organization, uh, a, a council of reference for an organization called Jews for Jesus. I love mixing with Jewish people. They are a very funny bunch uh, and laugh a lot and I love being with them. But it's hard for the Gentile mind to get behind the humor of the Hebrew here. And so you must do your very best to get into the Hebrew humor if you can. So all the excitement of this it is building as the, the dramatic tension rises. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound, this is verse 7, of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, blah, 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 all the peoples, nations, and men of every language. Now, they weren't all there, obviously, in the plain, but their representatives were there. They are to bow down and worship the image of gold that the king has set up. And then verse 8 introduces the dramatic tension in this story by reminding us that, oh, just wait a minute. There are at least three people, plus Daniel, who won't be able to enter into this because their allegiance will be divided. This might be a political gesture of bowing down to this statue, but for them it has significant religious overtones. What's going on in this chapter is very important. It is oppression from the state which is unintentional. Whereas in a moment in Daniel 6, we'll have oppression from the state, which is intentional. Now, most of us are likely to have pressure and persecution at the moment in Britain and the Western world from a state where it is unintentional pressure. The state, for example, may choose to pass a law against uh, religious hatred. It may be a law that's good, it may be a law that's bad. The law is not designed to hurt the Christian church, but it may, by implication, make our life more difficult. And it's very interesting that as our state and the state in the Western world develops, there are all sorts of situations in which the state can choose to uh, ask for allegiance to itself in such a way that Christians are not able to comply with its demands. And I do need to say to you that there are many signs in the Western world that with the last uh, years having a focus on the war against terrorism, the world in the West is moving in the direction away from civil liberties and freedom towards the state requiring compliance in ever more arduous ways. And the day is coming in our own nation and in the West in general when it is quite likely that one of the unintentional consequences will be that Christians will be put in a position where they cannot obey the state. And for some of us, for the first time in our lives, we will be faced with the need for civil disobedience. Now, I believe that day is probably coming. And there's going to be a significant challenge for the church of Jesus. It's not that the state will try and persecute us. 
It is simply that an unintended consequence of dealing with issue A means that for Christians over here, we are forced with making a tough decision. Let's face it, that's exactly what happened to the Christians in the first century who may have been asked to join the Roman military because they were forced to say... Caesar is Lord as part of their military vow and they were unable to say it because they could only say that Jesus was Lord and so they could not cross that line. Many of them were imprisoned, many of them were persecuted, many of them were threatened in a whole range of ways because the, the state's requirement meant that they were completely unable to follow through on that command. Steve, what is this? It was just, Steve was just telling me it was the Lord trying to get our attention. Uh, from time to time that noise will happen and uh, I hope that uh, God will give you the opportunity to uh, tune it out if you, uh, if you possibly can. So we find ourselves facing with Daniel's friends the unintended consequences of a state edict this morning. And uh, as I've just said, I do believe we may find ourselves in the years to come with this unintended consequence which we have to face. And so, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, come forward and they denounce the Jews because they know they won't be able to fulfill this political decree. Verse 9, O king, live forever. Do you remember the phrase? They keep on saying it to these kings and it keeps on not being true. You have issued a decree. You've said whoever doesn't bow down has got to go in the fiery furnace. But there are some Jews and you've already looked after them. These Jews who came from nowhere, from exile, you've honoured them, Nebuchadnezzar, you've given them everything, you've given them fantastic positions of power and influence, and still they're not grateful. Those ungrateful wretches are not at all pleased with the way you've honoured them. They won't bow down to your idol. Now, to give Nebuchadnezzar his credit, he doesn't instantly see them killed, because they're very senior officials, he gives them the opportunity to express themselves. Now he's pretty angry, verse 13. Furious with rage. Interestingly enough, the translation that Steve and Janet used a little earlier helped us see the literal Hebrew. His face distorted with rage. He was absolutely livid. I mean, you mustn't be too anxious about that. That's what ancient despots did before breakfast. They were livid a lot of the time, and people died in vast numbers as a result. Sometimes genocide took place because of the state of an ancient dictator's digestion. It, it was, a, it was a, a whimsical world in which horror could be perpetrated um, in, a, in a way completely uh, casual. So furious with rage, he summons them and says, look, is it true you won't serve my gods or worship the image of gold? Again, try and remember, this is not a religious question. He's not saying, is it true that you don't have this religious allegiance? He knows they don't have that religious allegiance. He knows they're Jews from Judea. He knows they worship a god that Daniel's told him about already. He's not stupid. He understands they have another religious allegiance. What he cannot understand is that the religious allegiance of the Jews is exclusive allegiance. He only understands polytheism. Have a God, any God, pick a God, worship a God, who cares? But these guys help Nebuchadnezzar understand that their allegiance is exclusive. Brothers and sisters, I believe this is one of the serious challenges facing Western Christianity. And it is this, it is around the uniqueness of Jesus. The theological issues of the next 10 years, I guarantee it, are going to be focused around, is Jesus the one and only way to God or not? Because in a world where tolerance is king, we are going to increasingly find that Christians are honoured, encouraged, tolerated as part of the great melting pot of the world. 
But the second the Christian says, Jesus Christ is the only way to God, we're going to find ourselves persecuted. I promise you that our exclusivity in that claim will be the thing which triggers persecution. People won't care two hoots if we want to worship Jesus and go to church. They'd be happy for us to do that, to go to a mosque, a temple, a synagogue, a church. They won't care. But the second you make exclusive truth claims, persecution comes. For these three guys, the problem is not only do they think their God's the God they should be worshipping, but they think he's the only God. And they are unique on that plane in that regard. Lots of people who bowed down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue thought he was nuts. But they just did it anyway and kept their mouth shut. And they didn't mind doing it because they got all sorts of other, their own God to worship and would do so when they went back home. But they were happy to bow in political allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar. But these three were not able to do it. So Nebuchadnezzar gives them another chance. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, la na 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 Get ready to fall down and worship the image I have made. And if you don't worship, you will be immediately thrown into the fiery furnace. And then, listen to this in verse 15, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Now, the Old Testament understanding of the word hand is about power. In Daniel 1, the very first verses we read two days ago, it said, and God gave Jehoiakim into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Here the same phrase is used. And I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace, and then what God will deliver you out of my hand? In other words, I've got the power. This is Nebuchadnezzar shaking his fist not in the face of three young Hebrews, but in the face of an almighty God and laying down a challenge and saying, we will go on surviving, Nebuchadnezzar seems to be saying, and your God's going to be nowhere in this picture. Now, I, I need to tell you that there have been many people down the course of history who've shaken their fist in the face of God and claim that he's irrelevant and dead and finished. Some of them have been dealt a serious blow immediately and some have just been proved wrong over a period of time. From the very trivial claims of John Lennon of the Beatles who once claimed that they were more popular than Jesus with all the sad stupidity of that quote and look where the situation is now all the way through to people like Voltaire and others who claimed that within a generation the Bible would be wiped out. And within a hundred years, his home was being used as a storage depot for the Bible Society. (laughs) Lots of people claim that God's finished and washed up. I assure you, he isn't. And the challenge is met. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied, and this is the crunch of this particular chapter before we, we quickly move on to the lions. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. This probably means we're guilty. We have no defence. We haven't bowed down. It sounds insolent here, but it isn't insolent. It is simply a straightforward statement of fact. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, and it's a massive kiln-type place, it may even have been the very kiln that fashioned the idol they were about to have to bow down to. Huge smelting area of enormous temperature. We may be thrown into the fiery furnace. The God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will rescue us from your hand. So he's the one who delivers in and out of hands, not you. He will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not... We want you to know, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship the image you have set up. So there. That, that bit's not in the, uh, the Hebrew uh, uh, Bible, the end bit. This is courage in the face of persecution. And the story goes on as you know. I haven't got time to deal with this because I need to get into the lions for a minute. Or more accurately, out of the lions. This is the classic persecution tale of deliverance. A wonderful success story. You know how it, you know how it goes. God will rescue us and even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow the knee to your statue. 
Nebuchadnezzar, face distorted with rage, uh, wraps them all up in their, in their proper uh, pompous vestments, as the passage says, uh, gets his strongest men, he's not going to see them rescued at the last minute, bound with strong ropes, have them thrown into the fire seven times hotter than ever. The blokes who throw them in are killed, it's so hot. They're thrown in, suddenly Nebuchadnezzar in his shot looks him, what's going on? Didn't I throw three men in there? Yes, now there are four. One of them looks like a son of God. Well, we're not sure who this was. Was it uh, a pre-incarnate vision of Jesus? Was it something called a theophany, God himself turning up in the furnace? Some people have even said it was Daniel. Actually, I don't think it was Daniel. I don't know where Daniel was in this chapter. It's a bit of an oddity. He, he may have been on holiday. Uh, he may have been doing foreign service for, for the king. He may have been, as the book later tells us, sick ill, unable to be at this celebration. Maybe he was so senior he didn't need to be at it. Who knows? But he's not here in this story. It's almost certainly either an angel or some kind of uh, divine representation. And they emerged unsinged. Their hair doesn't even smell smoky. Their clothes aren't even smouldering in any way. It's a fabulous, fantastic deliverance. And Nebuchadnezzar is absolutely thrilled. Praise be to God. They trusted him. He set them free. It's fantastic. And then he says, verse 29, I decree that every nation who any, or anybody who says anything about Shadrach, Abishak and Abednego shall be cut to pieces and their houses turn into piles of rubble. Now listen, this is classic Nebuchadnezzar. He can't say anything without threatening to kill somebody. I mean, that is what it is. Praise God or I'll kill you. Please hand me that book or I'll murder you. I mean, this was Nebuchadnezzar. This is the way he spoke to people. He couldn't either praise or condemn without threatening to kill you and turn your house into rubble. It got a bit boring after a while. How are you, O oh king? I know, yeah, yeah, if I say anything wrong, you're going to kill me and turn my house into rubble. Let's just skip that bit. And so he's so thrilled, he goes over the top, as usual, and says, everybody everywhere must know this is great. What a great God has come. So what should we be like in the face of pressure? Well, we should accept a miracle with gratitude, but we should accept the absence of a miracle with fortitude. Brothers and sisters, some of you, and uh, you're clear about this this morning, need a miracle of deliverance. You feel as if you're in a fiery furnace, metaphorically, and you need delivering, and you want to be set free, and for some of you, a great miracle will occur, and there'll be an answer, chains will be snapped, circumstances change, you'll be set free. But for others of you, Hebrews 11's description of this kinds of incident will be true. Some people did not escape the fiery furnace. Some were eaten by lions. Some were martyred for their faith. The key in this passage is not, you pray a prayer and are strong enough and God will always deliver you. That's not what this passage teaches. What the passage teaches is this. We will not bow down. We will not compromise. We will not give up on our Christian faith. We will not do something that we know is wrong and we will be rescued by the living God. And even if he doesn't rescue us, we're still not going to bow down to God. God is still going to be worth following. Even if he doesn't answer my prayer, even if I stay sick and don't get well, even if I'm not delivered from the fiery furnace, even if the lions eat me, even if my life ends, even if there isn't a simplistic answer to prayer, even if nothing seems to go right, God is still God and worth loving and following. Even if he doesn't answer my prayer, he's still God. Now, isn't that, that's, a, that's faith. That's a deep, mature level of faith. That is faith in the roar. And so we see these men resisting the unintentional consequences of a bad law. We ourselves in the West will be faced with this, I am sure. But in Daniel 6, do turn over to Daniel 6, you see direct, aggressive persecution. I've really got about 10 minutes to deal with this, so, so, uh, so just hang in there. Let, let me just say this uh, to you, though. There's quite a distinction between these passages. In chapter 6, you've got, with Daniel, you've got direct racism, a hatred of the Babylonians for the Jews. You've got jealousy of Daniel's high position. And you've got a full frontal persecution religious attack. They can't get him on grounds of character, Daniel 6 says. They can only get him on the grounds of obedience and observance of the law of his God. Now, we haven't got time to look at that, but you'll see that if you read those early chapters. 
Do try to get things in perspective this morning, if you will. I'm sure that where you are in your place of work or in your family or in your home, and if you're mocked for your faith or teased for it, that's tough. And I don't want in any way to ridicule or minimize that. But the theme of today at Spring Harvest is persecution. And, and we must bear in mind today, please spare a thought for these 200 million believers worldwide who are persecuted for their faith. Do spare a thought for that. Because the truth is that for most of us, the fiery furnace and the lion's den do not await us if we follow uh, our God into wherever he leads us. The question of perspective is very important because if not, we go away from a meeting like this full of saying, oh God, please help me in my place of persecution. And we imagine that we're like Daniel or these three men. And actually we've suffered nothing like this, most of us. The question of perspective is very important. I came across this some while ago, uh, which illustrates the question of uh, perspective. I would love it. You'll find it. Uh, helpful, I hope, and it will help you get your own persecution in a certain perspective. A mother was passing her daughter's bedroom. Daughter was a teenager. She was astonished to see the bed was nicely made up and everything cleaned and the room tidy for a change. Then she saw an envelope propped up in the center of the bed and it was addressed to her mother. With trembling hands and fearing the worst, mum opens the letter and it says, Dear mum, It is with great regret and sorrow that I am writing to you. I have had to elope with my new boyfriend because I wanted to avoid a scene with Dad and you. I've been finding real passion with John and he's so nice, even with all his piercings, tattoos, beard and motorcycle clothes. And it's not only the passion, Mum. I'm expecting John's baby and he says that we're going to be very happy. He owns a trailer in the woods and we're living there and he wants to have many more children with me. And that's one of my dreams as well. John has taught me that marijuana doesn't really hurt anyone. And we're going to be growing it in our garden and trading it with friends. This will help us pay for the cocaine and ecstasy which we're now using. In the meantime, we do pray that science will find a cure for AIDS so that John can get better. Don't worry, Mum, I'm 15 years old now and I know how to take care of myself and one day I'll come back so that you can get to know your grandchildren. Your daughter, Judith. And then over the page, there was a P.S. P.S. Mum, none of the above is true. I'm over at the neighbour's house. I just wanted to remind you that there are worse things in life than my report card. which is in my desk drawer. (laughs) I love you. Call me when it's safe to come home. (laughs) Now, I think that's a pretty intelligent teenager because that teenager forced their mother to engage a sense of perspective. This bad report card may not actually be the end of the world as we know it. But don't parents tend to overreact in those moments? Perspective is everything. Folks, it's right for you to be encouraged if it's tough for you in your workplace. It's right for you to be encouraged if you find being a Christian difficult where you live, the town or area you are. But I plead with you to get perspective And to be aware and prayerful of the millions for whom this kind of persecution, the Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego furnace and the Daniel lion's den are much more of a daily reality. This is not in chapter 6 the unintended consequence of a bad law. It is the direct attack on Daniel's God. Finally, verse... uh, um, Five tells us, these men said, we will never find a basis for charge against Daniel unless it is something to do with the law of his God. So they all went in a group to the king. The Aramaic here literally means they meant they went thronging. This was a lynch mob. This was no sophisticated, clever argument from cabinet ministers. These were political thugs looking for retribution on a hated Jew who happened to have been promoted to one of the highest positions in the land and a hated God who wouldn't fit in 
with all the other gods who claimed exclusivity, who claimed the right to allegiance alone above every god. What arrogance! We're fed up with this. How can we deal with it? Let's get rid of Daniel's God. So they say, let's pass a law, law of the Medes and the Persians, which was a kind of law beyond which there was no appeal. There was, you know, the normal law courts and then the House of Lords and then the European Court of Appeal. There was no law higher than the law of the Medes and the Persians. And Darius, who's in his 60s now, uh, ascending to the throne, and Daniel's an old man by this stage, Darius is fairly new to the throne, trying to cement the empire together. They come and they flatter him and they say, why not have a law where people can only worship you for one month? Again, this is both a political and a religious act. Let's do this, Darius, because what it'll do is it'll make you look good, it will cement the empire, they can go back to worshipping their old gods after a month, but at least for a month, you can be clearly in the frame in the whole empire like the Caesars in Roman times were, as a godlike figure. Won't this be fantastic? And uh, the, the king, sensing the political benefit of this and being flattered by the fawning rabble, says, what a great idea. People worshipping me for a month. Hard not to, it's hard, hard for it not to appeal to you, isn't it? Doesn't that appeal to you? People worship me for a month. What a nice idea. It's like that little phrase. Have you read the book of Esther recently? They say to the king, you know, Vashti's got rid of, and they say to the king, it's a lovely phrase in the Hebrew, they say to the king, we'd like to get together, king, if it's all right with you, the most gorgeous women in the land, and give them six months of beauty treatment, and teach them lots of different sexual activities and tricks, so they're right ready for you, and, and we'd like to get all these beautiful women together just for you. What do you think? And the Hebrew says, with some irony, and the king said, I think that's quite a good idea. (laughs) Oh, really? What a surprise. And so they say to Darius, why don't people worship just you for a month? Oh, now there's a thought. People could just worship me for a month. What What a good idea. So he signs it. The king is duped by the lynch mob. And suddenly... It's going to dawn on him what a stupid move it is because he likes Daniel and Daniel's very useful in the kingdom setting up all these satraps and getting the kingdom organised. So the lynch mob now pop round to Dan's place where he is as normal three times a day praying with his head out the window for everybody to see. What would you have done if you'd have been Daniel? I'd have said, oh boy, this is, this, things aren't looking good for the worship of the one true God. I'm still going to pray three times a day, but I'm going to close the window. But Daniel prays, and the scripture tells us an absolutely fascinating phrase. It says he prayed as he always did, as he had done before. Some of us want the deliverance of Daniel in the lion's den, but we're not prepared for the discipline of praying three times a day. Or to put it another way, we always want the miracles, but we're not prepared for the spiritual walk that often precedes it. Folks, Daniel prayed and had the courage to pray in the face of this edict. Why? Because he'd cultivated the habit of prayer. You will find it much easier as a Christian to sense God in the darkness if you have walked with him properly in the light. If we will cultivate habits of prayerfulness and spirituality in the light moments, then when it's really dark, we'll already have cultivated the habit of the presence of God. But far too many as Christians wait until trouble strikes and then we seek God and we wonder why we can't sense him. It is because Daniel had cultivated the habit of obedience that he is able to walk in obedience and continue to treasure that act of obedience. He continued to pray. I call on myself, on you, on us, to cultivate habits of prayerful obedience in the good times so that in the crisis we'll still be able to have the courage of our convictions. So he prays. And they rush back, this little lynch bob, but quite a busy day, rushing from the king, then back, And then back to the king and say, by the way, O king, a rather funny thing's happened as a result of your law. Daniel seems to have transgressed it. Now, who'd have thought? The king suddenly realises he's been conned, gets all his best lawyers on the case. 
No one seems to come up with an ability to get round this law, which cannot be broken. And so with great regret, he throws Daniel into the cave, seals it and says, I hope your God's able to deliver you. Not much faith there, but he goes home and he panics uh, and he can't sleep and he refuses to have entertainment brought to him, which may have been food or concubines. It's very difficult from the Aramaic word to know exactly what is thought of here, but he has a restless night. And then he comes back in the morning and he says, Daniel, has your God been able to deliver you from the mouth of the lions? And then the two most important words of this entire chapter follow. Daniel answered. Can you see why that's important? <laughs> because if Daniel hadn't answered, he'd have been dead. And so Daniel answered. He says, oh, king, I haven't done anything to do you wrong. He sort of puts the record straight. But an angel's come and closed the lion's mouths. And it wasn't because they'd had a very full supper the night before. Because Darius, typical dictator, in his anger, throws all the people who brought this accusation with their wives and children, horrible, brutal, wicked act, into the lion's den. And they're all gobbled up immediately. So it's not that the lions weren't hungry. It's simply that a miracle occurs. And so Daniel is set free and gloriously, wonderfully, even as an old man, he may have been in his 80s at this stage, he is wonderfully released to serve God another day. And Darius makes a similar proclamation to the one that Nebuchadnezzar has made. And only this time it's more positive, wanting to encourage everyone to worship and serve this God. And so the three boys and the elderly, now Daniel, find an opportunity in the face of persecution one with the state unintentionally persecuting them, and one in a position where the state deliberately by its law confronts religiosity. In both cases, both groups stand firm for God, and in both cases they're delivered. But the reality is, whether they would have been delivered or not, you notice Daniel prays before he knows he's going to be delivered from the lions. He doesn't know God's going to work that miracle, but he still retains his faith. And the challenge for us is to have the faith of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and of Daniel. And some of us will experience the miracle of the deliverance. The fiery furnace will not be our experience any longer. The lion's mouths will be shut. But for others of us, we will go through the Hebrews 11 experience. And persecution and pressure may come. Tragedy may strike. Difficulty may come. But we will not bow the knee. Or as the King James Version says of this, we are not careful how we answer you, Nebuchadnezzar. Threaten us all you want. We as the church in this nation will not bow the knee to the false gods of materialism and secularism. We will not compromise. There'll be no pluralism among us. We'll stick to the exclusive claims of Jesus Christ. The one true Yahweh God of Daniel and his friends is expressed in the one true Son of God, Jesus Christ. Whoever lives and who never dies and who is the only way to God and is the God worth worshipping above others, whether he answers our prayers or doesn't answer our prayers, he is Lord and King and ruler of all. Come back tomorrow for the end of the story. A special thank you to Steve in the face of unintentional, I wouldn't quite call it persecution, but uh, distraction from those whose concern is the, uh, the well-being of our big top. Let's just, this, this, these are important moments uh, when we finish. Let's just take one minute to be quiet and to allow good seed which has been sown to take root in our hearts just to remember those words about the pressures that we face, whether they are direct and intentional or unintentional, where we might face those from some political source or whether it's something smaller in our workplace, even in our own home. The reminder to receive miracles with gratitude, but to receive the lack of of a miracle.